Good morning and welcome to worship at Sandal Methodist Church. A real welcome to everyone, wherever you are. A particular welcome to our friends at Criddleston, Lakeside, New Miller Dam and Walton. And also a particular welcome to all the ladies who are sharing with us in worship. And I'd like to give you this virtual daffodil. Uh, to all the ladies. Uh, so there you go. There's a virtual daffodil. It's not costing the church that much this year. Uh, but we do want to particularly welcome all the ladies who share in worship. And I know that for some people, Mothering Sunday is not always that easy. But we want everyone to know that we're caring about them. And we want them to know God's presence today. So let's speak to God now in prayer. Creator God, we thank you on this day for our mothers. We thank you for all those within society who have a mothering influence upon us. We thank you for all the support and encouragement that we receive and have received throughout our lives. And today we seek to know your presence with us in our worship that we might know your real love for us. We pray, come Holy Spirit, come. Come Holy Spirit, come. We sing our first hymn, as the deer pants for the water. Let us join together in our prayers, prayer of adoration. Eternal God, we praise you, for you are the source of light and life. 
Your word made the whole of creation in all its beauty and splendor, bringing order out of chaos, light out of darkness. We praise you that the evidence of your creative activity is all around us still. We praise you, Father, for your supreme revelation of yourself in our Lord Jesus Christ, for the clear vision of your love that we see in him. Inspire us now with the life and light he came to bring, that our praises may be worthy of him and resound to his honour and glory for his sake. Amen. Prayer of Confession Creator God, you know us better than we know ourselves, and in the light of your glory, all the darkness of our sin is revealed. In your presence we confess our failure to respond fully to your commandment to love, our reluctance to follow you, our desire to please ourselves rather than to serve you. We confess that we have only feebly responded to that clear revelation given to us in Jesus, and that we have allowed the light of his glory to be obscured by our own apathy and indifference. Creator God, you know us better than we know ourselves, but we know that we are sinners. Grant us an awareness of sins forgiven that, and your abundant grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A prayer of thanksgiving and dedication. Creator God, we thank you for those glimpses we have had of, our, of your glory which have brought us to our knees in wonder and praise. We thank you for the quiet moments when we have been surrounded by the beauty of nature in the valleys, on the hills, or by the water. We thank you for the stirring moments when music or drama has lifted us beyond the ordinary to new realms of bliss and delight. We thank you for those moments of insight and vision of Jesus, the living word, which have come to us in fellowship with other Christians as we have shared an act of worship or quietly read your word in our homes. We thank you for the coming of Jesus into the world, for his life and death, his resurrection and ascension, the light shining in our darkness bringing divine illumination, renewing our vision. We thank you for those who seek to widen and enrich our vision through their work as artists, musicians, theologians, teachers or preachers. We thank you for the way these insights can transform our everyday life and experience, bringing new hope and fresh inspiration. Creator God, we offer ourselves again to you, rejoicing that we have seen your glory in the face of your Son, committed in the power of the Spirit to share our vision with others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The reading is taken from John, chapter 12, starting at verse 20. Among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Gentiles. They approached Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we should like to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and the two of them went to tell Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. In very truth I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains that and nothing more. But if it dies, it bears a rich harvest. Whoever loves himself is lost, but he who hates himself in this world will be kept safe for eternal life. If anyone is to serve me, he must follow me. Where I am, there will be my servant will be. Whoever serves me will be honoured by the Father. Now my soul is in turmoil, and what am I to say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. A voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. 
The crowd standing by said it was thunder they heard, while others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus replied, this voice spoke for your sake, not for mine. Now is the hour of judgment for this world. Now shall the prince of this world be driven out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I shall draw everyone to myself. This he said to indicate the kind of death he was to die. Amen. Let's speak to God in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Can I just invite you all just to stand if you want to stretch your legs for a moment and we'll say the peace to one another. The peace of the Lord be always with you. The peace of the Lord be with us all. Amen. I wonder if you've ever noticed how in some TV soaps there can be a lot of suspense, a lot of tenseness about it. People get really tense. I think EastEnders, for me, would be the one that I I just feel is just too tense. I can't cope with it. Not these days, anyway. But I'm like that with films as well. Remember the music from Jaws. Dun, 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 dun. And how the suspense just seemed to build. I was watching the movie with a friend in the cinema when the shark comes up to try and get the man on the end of the boat as he's feeding fish off the back of the boat. And the jaws come up and I'm in the cinema with a box of Maltesers on my knee. And suddenly the Maltesers just went everywhere. I jumped out of my skin. It's almost as if the writers need to build up the tension. 
the suspense to make some point or to get everyone right on the edge of their seats. Part of the tragedy of our scene in scripture, in our story with Jesus, Lazarus, Martha and Mary, was that Jesus badly needs and wants his followers all to be united at that point. The rest of the world are plotting against him, so his friends should at least have the good sense, you would hope, to stick together and to back him. But, oh no, we can feel the tension, the suspense crackling in the air. There's the obvious confrontation between Judas and Mary. But even before that, consider the simple words, Martha served, then Mary took a pound of perfume. We've obviously met the sisters before in the previous chapter and at the end of Luke chapter 10. Every word written about them in the Gospels helps us to get to know the sisters and the dynamic of their relationship. Martha, as in Luke, has been working hard. She's made a great dinner for Jesus and all his friends and followers. Mary, not to be outdone, steals centre stage. Not this time simply by sitting at the feet of Jesus but by her apparent outrageous gesture of anointing Jesus' feet and wiping them with her hair. She would need to let her air down for this purpose. You can just imagine, can't you, the onlooker's reaction, particularly in that day. Had she no shame? What was she trying to say to Jesus, to the onlookers? All sorts of disturbing thoughts must have been flying around the room. There's a, a peculiar tension in the air. After all the things that Jesus had said and done and the warnings of violence being plotted against him, what was going on here? We can perhaps imagine in particular how Martha felt. She may well have thought that Mary had really gone well over the top this time. But it was actually Judas who came out and said it. The other disciples, well, they just look on, quite embarrassed possibly by Mary's extravagance, by Judas, Judas's outburst, and perhaps also by Jesus and his strange comment. John is quite clear here where the blame lies. Judas, he says, had in any case been helping himself out of the common purse. So his reaction was not sincere anyway, but out of selfish motives. But Jesus goes way beyond all this. What he says is a little bit difficult to translate. And John may well have known that what he's written doesn't quite make full sense. It suggests that Mary had been keeping this expensive perfume to anoint his body after death. In other words, her act of real love is a prophetic statement about the fact that before too long, Jesus is going to be buried. And buried so quickly that there might not be any proper time for anointing. So we'd better have it right away. It does suggest, on the other hand, that Mary should now keep it, anything that's left of the anointing oil for the day of Jesus' burial. And that this purpose is more important even than selling it and giving it to the poor, which is a bit ironic because they're in Bethany, which means house of the poor. In other words, even if she hadn't done what she just did, it would still have been appropriate to hang on to it for that all-important occasion. What an unusual thing for Jesus to say when he'd repeatedly spoken about the importance of the poor and all the kingdom blessings which would come to them. The only explanation is that Jesus believed that his coming death would be the action through which the whole world as a whole would be put right. But it's hard to get your head around this. 
But there's no escaping the challenge posed by the standoff between Mary and Judas. It's one of those stories which sort of grabs you and demands of you, where are you in the story? Are you with the shameless Mary, worshipping Jesus with everything that she's got? Risking the wrath of her sister, who's doing all the hard work, the anger of the men, who perhaps don't quite trust their own feelings when a woman lets down her hair in public. And then there's the sneer of the person who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. Where are you? Or are you in the story with the cautious, prudent, reliable Judas? As he must have been relied upon with all of them because they put him in charge of the money. He was looking after the meagre resources of a group without any steady or settled income, anxious to provide for their needs and still have something left over for the poor. Remember that when Judas left the Last Supper, the others all guessed that he might have been going off to give something to the poor because that was what he normally did. So if you put aside for one moment your natural inclination to distance yourself from Judas, after all, even at that last moment, none of the other disciples had suspected him of treachery or betrayal. Can you just see a little glimpse of him as you look in the mirror at yourself? Where are you in the story? Or are you back in the kitchen with Martha? If so, how do you feel about Mary or about Judas? And how do you feel about Jesus and all that he said? Some years ago, I was preparing for a funeral of a lady called Martha. She was someone who was always busy in the kitchen, but she would get anxious when she had visitors. So her husband quoted from the authorised version, Martha, Martha, thou art full of care and troubled by many things. Thinking back to the scripture story. And as they talked about Martha, I was thinking about my mother, Mary, who was always bustling away in the kitchen and preparing for us as a family in the farmhouse kitchen. And my mind went to mum in the kitchen. And a little meditation came into my mind at that point. Are you Martha or are you Mary, bustling in the kitchen or sitting at the feet of Jesus? Only two weeks later, I had an awful shock. My mother was taken ill with leukemia and died quite suddenly. And when she died, that meditation came back into my heart and mind as I thought of her. And, you know, she was always bustling away in the kitchen. And at her funeral, I read a meditation about mum as we gave thanks for her and celebrated her life. Are you Martha or are you Mary, bustling away in the kitchen or sitting at the feet of Jesus. And the closing line was, because that's all right with me. We've always missed mum bustling in the kitchen and having her as the matriarch of our family. You know, are you Martha, are you Mary, bustling in the kitchen or sitting at the feet of Jesus? Because that's all right for me, for us as a family. We always have missed mum but we're pleased to know that she's sitting at the feet of Jesus. On this day, some of us love Mothering Sunday, others perhaps find it a more difficult day. It's a day of celebration and a day of reflection. So I want to just be aware of that as we close at this point. Sue will lead us in prayer but in our prayers and in our thoughts, we're mindful of each person and all that they're experiencing at this time, whether it be because of COVID or whether it be because of Mothering Sunday. I pray at this time that you might know God's real love. As you think and reflect on your loved ones, as you also sit and reflect upon God's love for you. Amen.
We now have our prayers of intercessions. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the blessings in our lives. We pray now for those struggling at this time. We pray for our world in these difficult times, that your peace will reach across borders and into the lives of all your people. We pray for our Christian brothers and sisters, living in lands where they risk their liberty and lives to follow you. Be their courage and strong foundation. We pray for leaders and others in positions of authority and power, that they will be guided by you. We pray for your churches who await your direction. May your will be done. We pray for all people suffering with ill health at this time, for those awaiting treatment or test results, for those recovering from operations or illness, for those suffering with mental health problems. May you heal them. We pray for all who have suffered the loss of loved ones. May you be their source of strength to face another day. We pray for ourselves. May we be people of peace and justice, bringing hope to those we interact with. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. We now say together the modern form of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us in worship today. I hope that in some sense you found it helpful and that you've known God's presence with you. Our Real Love Lent series continues on a Wednesday evening at seven o'clock. If you'd like to join us then, please get in touch if you'd like the details. And also after our service, we meet in a Zoom coffee. But I hope that wherever you are, you might know God's blessing this day. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen.